Hello, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And thanks for joining us today in our Government Contractors Live Q&A Cafe series. Uh, this webinar series is hosted monthly throughout the year. It's the second Friday and it usually runs about an hour and a half. Uh, we're going to go through some content slides and then we'll take some live uh, Q&A from the audience. So as we're going through the presentation today, please uh, feel free to use the menu button on the right hand side of your screen. There's a chat uh, button or also a question button and you can type in your questions there. Uh, we won't interrupt the speakers as they're going through their slides, so we'll address your questions in the order that they came in uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, questions are also anonymous, so don't feel like we're going to read out your name and, and call you out if you have a, a question that you might think is, um, uh, you know, inappropriate or not the smartest uh, question to ask. There are no stupid questions, so please feel free to type them in and the speakers will uh, gladly answer them for you. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, we're going to make that available at the same registration link that you used and the PowerPoints, uh, as they always are, are available on slideshare.net. Um, this is just a layout of the, um, of the schedule for the year. So January, we covered CMMC, February, OTAs, and so forth. Uh, obviously, this month is sales and capture. Uh, next month, we'll cover, uh, again, with four panelists, proposal writing, August, we'll get into compliance, uh, September oral presentation. Uh, we'll close out the year in December with mergers and acquisitions and government contracting. So uh, again, it's always the second Friday of the month for panelists, content, and then uh, Q&A. Quick blurb about us. Uh, we do provide consulting services for uh, federal contractors. We work with product, service, and software companies providing all the services that you see here on your screen. If you want more information, go to our website, give me a call, shoot an email, send a smoke signal, and we'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, we've got a newsletter that goes out every Monday and sometimes more than that. Uh, we reach about 23,000 federal government contractors. Um, we do have advertising options available and we are running some discounts this month uh, on some bulk packages. So if you've got questions, again, just go to our website, shoot us an email that way, and we can uh, provide the rates for the newsletter. Uh, this year, 2021, uh, we are covering uh, the DFAR, so the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. There's uh, 52 uh, parts of that. And so 52 weeks in the year, we decided to cover each part uh, on Wednesdays. It's complimentary. 12 o'clock, those are recorded. You can find those on our website, on the YouTube channel. Um, and in 2020, if you wanna kind of rewind a little bit, uh, we did cover all parts of the FAR. Again, 52 parts, more or less. There's a couple that are reserved. Um, and again, all on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, what's coming up? Uh, July 8th is a partnership with uh, the Virginia PTAC. Uh, we're going to talk about GSA schedules, what's in it for you, and then Thursday, July 1st, uh, marketing and messaging for GovCons. Uh, that's with the Catalyst Center. They're a, um, uh, I think, funded through a grant uh, through the SBA, uh, provide services for government contractors. Okay, and in uh, 2022, we're going to cover uh, the FAR supplement. So uh, keeping in the same theme of the FAR and the DFARs, we're going to go through each of the regulations for uh, the various departments and agencies that you see listed here. We already have our speakers lined up. Again, those will be Wednesdays next year at 12 o'clock. Those are complimentary. They'll be recorded and posted on the website. And special thanks to our sponsors today, the Virginia PTAC. Uh, they offer training, one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, mentorship, and they do host some events pre-COVID. I think uh, slowly they're maybe getting back to, um, uh, to that, maybe towards the end of the year. Uh, but they're a great resource for, again, training and counseling for uh, aspiring or kind of startup government contractors. Uh, our other sponsor is Crown Castle. They provide IT uh, services to both uh, civilian and DOD agencies, and they also sell to government contractors. Peter, Peter O'Brien uh, is your main contact there. He's the BD guy that handles um, uh, federal uh, contracting sector. Okay, uh, and here we are, uh, Friday, June 11th. It's a little bit after 12, and we're gonna talk about sales and capture. We've got uh, four great speakers. 
Uh, Mark Hogan comes to us from a government sales specialist. I've known Mark for several years. They offer a lot of great services for government contractors, uh, focused obviously on sales. Uh, Alexia Smitrova Taylor, OST Global Solutions, has been a great partner of ours for many years. Um, glad to have you with us, Alessia. Stephen Vito, a uh, good friend, and have known him for a couple of years as well, uh, provides great services, and we have worked together on some uh, big projects. We worked together on a Brother Printer and a couple others where uh, Steve was instrumental in helping them um, with marketing and messaging. Con Wilson, uh, I've also known Con for several years. Uh, her group does a, a great job of uh, providing capture support, uh, and she's well known in the government contracting sector. Okay, so uh, you guys just tell me when you're ready for the next slide, but uh, we're going to kick it off with this one, which sales and business development are the same, right? Not too much. <laughs> you want me to start here, guys? Go for it. Go right ahead. Yeah, so so you know it's it's an interesting environment that we sell into, and and a lot of people confuse sales, which is a, in a definition of most people's transactional less than nine month window, uh, and oftentimes BD is nine months and further out. Different size deals, different size transactions, different actions to get to those same places, and it's really a different set of skills uh, that, that go into closing the deals. Right, so BD is more capture, more writing proposals and things like that, where sales is more, let's go close something quickly, hopefully in a sole source basis. So, you know, Mark, um, so uh, along that lines too, is that I think it all kind of depends on the size of your organization too. I work with a lot of the emerging small, small businesses, the mid-tier businesses. And sometimes when you're small, which I think a, a number of our, you know, like uh, attendees here today is that how do you have a sales and a BD team? Like, are they two separate functional groups? Are they two separate people? Are they multiple people? Um, and, and when you're a small business, sometimes you have to multi-hat. So, um, you know, I get this request a lot is that, you know, what are the key attributes and, you know, like how do you define sales and BD? Where is that line of demarcation? Where does one start? Where does one begin? And it's really difficult to answer sometimes because you want to give the textbook, you know, response, um, you know, as far as how we define it in the GovCon sector versus the commercial sector. Um, but sometimes it's not so easy just because you are dual hatting. You may be using maybe the wrong person with the wrong skill sets in the you know in that position because they they drew the short straw, or it's because they're the business owner, or you know it's like uh, you know I know Alessia you probably have run into this too is that it's it's really hard to have one definition for that um, well, depending upon your organization. It is, and, and I agree with you. Um, here's here's the thing, you know, uh, so sales generally i mean we're all in sales bd is sales so because sales is such an all-encompassing kind of big concept uh of you know you have, you have sales you have marketing right people don't talk about bd outside the government contracting well why do people talk about bd in government contracting well because nobody really likes to have the word sales the government typically doesn't like to be sold to and you ask the gavi you know basically hey you know what do you think of sales people and they're like well you know used car salesman right away, right away. They make jokes about that. So um, generally business development people don't even like to have a BD title on their cards because now it's associated with sales. They will have a title of program manager, account manager, customer advocate, something that takes them away from that mentality where the government, you know, it, the business is right as capitalism, right? So we're all commercial and we understand how they work, but the government's, is public servants right so their their job is service and so it's fundamentally very different from a commercial organization coming into that world so when you're coming into the world of service you typically don't want to be selling something and uh you you just basically are essentially serving and that's the whole sort of mentality right so that's why that's why i think the bd sometimes masks that but then when you really think about sales you have sales and you have complex sales and complex sales is the same thing as bd right whereas regular sales is usually like product sales or something like that 
Yeah, and so I think, um, Jennifer, our, our second slide kind of keys up the rest of the conversation in the next subsequent slides um, kind of nicely. And so, you know, um, you know, what do you want to kind of highlight about this? Because, you know, there, there are some nuanced differences and, and, and you're right, you know, titles kind of do change depending upon how that organization or people, you know, feel or, you know, the impression that they have about, you know, some of these activities. Yeah, I yeah. can take a jump at this too. So, so you know, me in a sales environment, and, and really my company, hence the name government sales specialist, really mostly salespeople and market, a little bit of, of lead gen, a little bit of research, but really what our job and function is, and, and my job description for my sales staff is rapidly identify and qualify an opportunity. Um, and, and, and you're right, it's mostly products, it's some services, uh, some are big deals, some are small deals, but most of them are all relatively quick and we generally close deals in less than, than 18 months and certainly a lot less than six months even. Um, and they're, if you do it the right way in a sole source way, but they're, we don't really look at the large uh, captured BD things that are more than 18 months out. That's where we look to you guys and send business your way to help with that side of the, of the shop because of the way that we're structured over here. But the salespeople we're looking for uh, and the ones that we use are, are aggressive, fast, and, and they have a lot of accounts and they move rapidly through that as opposed to waiting uh, and, and processing, a, a, you know, for instance, an RFP response and all the steps that you guys do with that. Yeah, and let me just kind of, uh, you know, since we have that process slide to walk you guys through that, to understand the difference actually between what Mark does, where he increases that sales velocity uh, versus what a traditional BD process is in the government, right? So this is the business development BD life cycle, right? So you start out with building capacity by investing in new business capabilities. What does that mean? Uh, you as a as somebody, you know, there may be business owners among the audience here. Uh, you're basically making decisions all the time or, or business development directors or whoever's in charge of making decisions of where the company goes. So you see requests for proposals, you see customer requests for specific things, right, items in the proposal, right? So they may be asking for ISO certification, they may be asking for DCA compliance, they may be asking for facility clearance, they may be asking for certain capability you don't have, but if you had, you actually would be able to win those bids. And so you're constantly investing into your business based on what the customer is telling you they want. So you're making those smart decisions. Then you conduct strategic business development planning session annually and revisit that quarterly and live that every day. That is essentially when you decide what you're gonna go after and uh, how you're gonna go ahead and win that and what's in your, Bailey, we can what's not, right? So you you have to do market research, which is step number three to inform that process. Once you have enough information to make decisions, you market to target agencies and partners, and that's actually what uh, Stephen's uh, you know domain is. You actually do the marketing, and marketing is incredibly important because that allows you to draw the partners and the customers to you, and you also build an opportunities pipeline, and uh, essentially. What you do is you uh, check opportunities for strategic fit and develop a list. It's a dynamic list, the simplest way, right, of different opportunities that are time-based. What are we going to bid on this month? What are we going to bid on next month, in six months from now, in a year from now, five years from now? Now some of you are competes when you are the incumbent. All need to be in a pipeline. And from there, you actually then qualify each individual opportunity. You have to look at it in greater detail. You have to research that opportunity. That's what I call top-down capture, as you can see there. And then you have the longest step, which is step number seven, is you conduct capture. Capture is customer engagement, intelligence gathering, win strategy development, competitive analysis, teaming, and solution development. And then after that, the RFP comes out and you prepare your proposal. And then you perform business development during project execution by adding modifications, adding additional scope to your contracts, uh, feeding your pipeline, finding out about new opportunities. So, and, and then that whole wheel keeps turning and hopefully that's your engine that fuels your business with growth. Now, what Mark was really referring to is saying, hey, you know, why don't we actually um, skip some of the steps, right? So what if we went sole source and uh, we were just closing on an opportunity without going into capture and without having to write a competitive proposal. What if we just simplified the whole process and sped it up? 
right? So that's where the closing piece really figures in. Um, so you actually are doing more sales than BD. Yeah. So I think a really good um, that's that's actually a really good place to kind of segue um, into our our next slide here in a second is that um, I, I think the key takeaway from is you know is sales and BD the same is that they're similar. You're you're sharing some common like missions and goals. But the, the the strategy and and the tac the tactics may be different and, and the activities that you do may be different, but you also need to make sure that they're um, in sync with each other. So I, I I work with a lot of small businesses where you've got your sales staff going and selling something different, and then you've got your BD staff doing something totally different, and they're they're not in sync. And so in in some regards, um, they. They are similar, but they're not the same, obviously, as, as we've demonstrated here, but they need to have the same mission goals and they need to uh, need to agree on what the proper strategy is for that. Um, and so segue into this now, you know, let's let's follow the money where, you know, where is the fastest path to getting, you know, work? Yeah, so I, I can talk a bit about some of the favorite ones that we have out there. So Jennifer was talking when we started about some of the uh, the federal acquisition regulation uh, uh, conferences she's going to have. And, and for those that care, it's about 2,000 pages of FARs out there, not counting supplements, not counting you know, the DFARs, which are slightly different, the defense uh, federal acquisition regulations. But the good news about having all these rules laid out is they describe about 60 different ways to sole source a deal. Um, and so you have to kind of know the nuances and you have to know the, the favorites at the time and what agencies sometimes like different types of ways to do it than other agencies. What, for instance, the Veterans Administration loves to work with service disabled veteran owned businesses. And they've set aside rules where you can sole source up to $11 million in business through an SDVO. Um, they've recently been making it easy even to sole source deals without having a small business where they've uh, raised the minimum or maximum for, before you had to be a competitive procurement to $800,000 now, if you're a smaller company, that could be a, a significant amount of money uh, with a simplified acquisition threshold. Uh, but but really a lot of different ways to do it. The the, the small businesses are, are, are clearly one of the favorites, the 8As are minority owned businesses, SDBOs. Um, of late, the government's really been aggressive in making it easy to sole source through what they call OTAs, other transaction authorities, because everything's got to have an acronym. And those are, Things like CSOs, because more acronyms, commercial solution offerings, are RIFs, rapid innovation funds, and I can keep on going. There's a whole bunch of these. And, and it's fascinating because they'll have a pitch day. We just participated, just won a deal out of uh, Space Force the other day, where, you, where one of our clients, we got together a, a, a deck for them. It was literally, it was a, a five-page white paper. It was 10 slides. We submitted it. They were invited to give a pitch. They gave a pitch, and then they basically, within a couple of weeks, sent a check. For a few hundred thousand dollars, so it's a it's a fascinating way to get some of these smaller business smaller deals in, which really is just beginnings. Then you can use that to grow and, and make it bigger. So knowing all these different ways to sole source, knowing how to put the paperwork together, because it's a different set of paperwork. There's usually uh, what are called J and A's, justification and authorizations, which makes it basically supports the case for a sole source. And, and I'm going to tell you, almost everything, with the exception of maybe lead pencils and pens. Can be sole sourced if you do it correctly. Even then, you could probably make make a case for sole sourcing if it's got the right attributes. Um, and then uh, uh, using that and, and providing a JNA, maybe a market survey where you can say these are the competitors and they don't do what we do here, and providing that to the contracting officer and, and having them decide whether to go you know, small business go through that way. And then, frankly, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the most popular uh, method for us here at GSS over the past 18 years has been task orders against large systems integrators contracts. Because there's always an integrator in there. Um, almost always there's scope, we call it, if it fits within the, their scope of their contract, you can then do a task order against that particular contract. And then that happens really fast. It's, once again, you still need a JNA, you may need a market survey, but those things happen fast. Prior to me starting this company, I ran a company called BEA Government Systems, the web logic guys for those that have been around for a while. And and virtually everything we did there was sole source, and it was hundreds of millions of dollars. And almost everything we did there was was through a task order. So that's a that's a, a fast, easy way to do it. Plus, you make friends with the integrators; they always like the free business. You just want to jump in on the sole source stuff? So, well, um, yeah, I think Alyssa, you've got a couple of slides here. Yeah, there's a slide that follows this. Um, so, so right. So what basically what happens is. Um, 
as, as we just talked about, it basically sole source bypasses capture and competitive proposal process, which is what speeds everything up. Although large sole sources, they do take quite a bit of time uh, to put together. But you know, like some sole sources, like 8A sole sources, are only a couple of weeks really to throw together. That's the easy button for the government. Uh, so where they could really become important is right around now, right? So which is we're in a fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, and as you know, the government has a really interesting pattern, right? So like you can see on the graphic here, there are, um, at the beginning of the quarter, there's always a small spike in the issuance of the RFPs. In the first quarter, um, which starts October 1 uh, of, the, of the government fiscal year, it basically of their calendar year, right? So like the government fiscal year starts October 1 of the calendar year. And uh, that first quarter is pretty busy. So that's why our holidays get, uh, if you're in business development or, you know, you own the company and you do the proposals, you know that your Thanksgiving is going to be ruined, your Christmas is going to be ruined. <laughs> what, holiday? Yeah, <laughs> what holiday? Yeah, what holiday? What weekends? I'm sorry. And then Q2, it kind of slows down. Right, so Q2 kind of slows down. Q3 um, is is really dead, right? So springtime, that's where you plan your vacations. Your March, your April, your May is going to be really slow. It really depends on the agency to whom you're bidding, but that's right around the time frame. Kind of is dead. And then the summer comes and things really pick up. Like we're really, really experiencing this right now at OST. Like we got, we're just you know, working 60, 80, 100 hour work weeks. Um, yeah. So doing doing the proposals, doing captures, things are about like, things are either in draft or the final RFP. Um, and uh, we're constantly kind of uh, are, are working around the clock. Um, so so I, I, would, I would also add to that too, is that um, there is going to be obviously some ebbs and flows like Alyssa mentioned. Um, in within like a, cal a fiscal calendar fiscal year. So you know, for for those who are new to government contracting, the government operates on a fiscal year that goes from October to September um, instead of a calendar year. Um, however, uh, those fluctuations do vary based on some political events. So when there's a change in administration, there's always going to be some delays and some uh, some slowness um, in the procurement cycle. Um, within the last year and a half, because of the pandemic, um, that has thrown the entire 2020 and 20 part of 21 um, into like a, a tizzy. I would say that like the last year and a half has been like a, the biggest outlier as far as, you know, like if we were going to look back in the next 10 years, they're going to throw out 2020 and 2021 uh, because there are so many factors that impacted the government procurement cycle um, and, and, and the ways of procuring. So COVID-19, the be, you know, like there were so many, uh, you know, like opportunities for uh, procuring like you know sole sourcing like more rapid pace type of sourcing uh, but at the same time because of the cycle of where a lot of the uh, best-in-class vehicles you'll hear BICs um, as well as government-wide acquisition contracts or GWACs those types of contracts have been um, like they, they've been on steroids lately with delivery and task orders um, that they're coming out just because of where they are in the cycle, the awards of new contractors to that cycle, and it's just made it so much easier with the fix to be able to procure across the government. Um, and so for, you know, proposal professionals, you know, and capture professionals like, you know, like myself and Alessia, you know, it's, we haven't had a slow cycle probably in like the last 18, 20 months. Um, so I'm going on vacation sometime soon. <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck. <laughs> By the way, marketing people, we have we have holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So sorry. We are in the wrong business. Yep. All right. So so basically what, what you have there, right? So like you have the situation that right now we're in the fourth quarter and we are doing selling and closing, basically, at this point. Because what, what really is happening, right? The procurements are being issued, there is a lot of activity going on, but Basically, you need to be talking to the government decision makers because they've got money to spend before the end of the quarter. Uh, and for some of them, it's lose it or use it or lose it, right? So for others, not so much, but it really depends which agency you're working with. And uh, essentially, the ones that 
basically have to obligate the money before the end of the year, uh, you need to be talking to them because he, you know, tell you an anecdote, right? So like one of uh, our clients um, gets a phone call from a contracting officer and it's, you know, somebody they kind of knew, right? They weren't working with that agency and the contracting officer, they were talking to him. Contracting officer gives them a call on a Friday afternoon and, uh, the, uh, they say, hey, you know, I need a warehouse cleaned up. Can you guys do this? I got some money for that. And, uh, and he goes, yep, we can do this. So my client and his brother, right? He's the business owner and his brother. They, they couldn't find anybody quickly enough. Uh, and the company was really small back then. Uh, they went ahead and rolled up their sleeves and cleaned up the warehouse itself over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. They worked themselves into pulp. And they did such a great job. The contracting officer was so grateful, grateful that it was an FAA. Now they clean up an FAA. <laughs> so they're the go-to person now for everything. And, you know, come the come September, uh, you know, it's it's ka-ching, 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 right? So, like, it's really about talking to the decision makers. It's about being there. It's about actual sales uh, and uh, offering the capabilities. And uh, you have to also know how to... Um, get the sole sources awarded to you. There's a know-how to that, as Mark alluded to. Uh, there's a lot of know-how uh, that's built into that. Um, source, sole source proposal preparation. Uh, there's know-how in that as well, because you know there, there's, there's stuff that you give to the government that becomes the fodder for the JNA. And yeah. so you have to think it through for them. Go ahead. Done. So I think, Jennifer, if you go to slide 18, I think that kind of cues up a lot of um, the next slide here because this slide is very similar to what we had reviewed before. Um, but the next slide has a couple of um, uh, steps here um, that you can take. And, and, and Alyssa, that, that brings up a really good question because I know that um, I, I get a lot of these questions um, from, from clients is, you know, you hear terms like, you know, JNAs and different things like that. Um, you know, is this something that, you know, they can do? Is it a contracts person? Do you have to go through an attorney? You know, like everybody wants to go to an attorney, you know, it's like, um, so, so Mark, you know, what is some of the best ways to kind of, you know, position and, um, uh, you know, prepare to get sole sources like that? Well, you know, there are tricks to uh, putting together g &A. It's actually understanding why the government can issue a procurement and how do you actually justify uh, the procurement? Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, like for example, if there's urgency, right? How do you describe the urgency? If there's one of a kind item, how do you describe that? And how do you not mix up the urgency and one of a kind? Because those are two separate items. And so you have to do this correctly, right? So, uh, and Mark can probably speak to more of that, but, uh, it's uh, it's 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 really you know there's a know-how that's that's you'll see you'll see a lot of companies that get sole sources all the time like Mark was alluding to like in his previous company and there are companies who have never gotten a sole source and they have an A you know you probably have some people in the audience like that you hey I'm an A I heard it was the easy button I've never gotten a sole source I see that all the time so it, it, there is a know-how to that. Yeah, there's and, and it's interesting, and I'll just say as a blanket statement, all of us on this panel and probably several in the audience have been doing this so long, we kind of lose sight of the fact that for us, it's second nature, but for people outside looking in, this is really difficult, right? Because, you know, first of all, you, you have to know what a JNA is, and you have to go try to find samples of that, which is, they're not easy to find. You know, we have a whole filing cabinet, of, it's not the virtual filing cabinet anymore, obviously, of, of JNAs, and so you have to you have to understand that, unless you hit the nail on the head, too, you have to figure out what they're what they need to do to, to make the JNA accepted. And to do that, you actually have to meet with the decision makers, which is a big hurdle as well for people outside of the government. So, but knowing how to do it, having the, the forms, the forms themselves are pretty simple. The, the JNAs we've been doing lately are literally one to two pages. Um, and then a third page, if there's a market survey, and you guys know what a market survey, it's that ubiquitous box that almost every company has where they have you and competitor C, D, and E, and you have the check marks, right? That's a, that's a market survey. So, so it, it's it's the a little bit of knowledge that you need uh, to be able to get that done correctly. They're making it easier, like I said, with the OTAs, because in, in essence you're doing a, a JNA, but you don't know that you're doing it when you submit your white paper and your slides. But but it, it is a it is a process, and you have to know how to do that. And it's uh, I wish I could tell you there's easy ways to go out and get that, but they're really 
I mean, other than doing some Google searches, maybe finding one, but it, to, you really have to have that relationship with the customer. And then as an extension that have created the demand, right? Well, a lot of people think, oh, I've got a schedule where all my orders or I'm an 8A, where all my orders, someone's got to go create the demand so that you have that. Uh, someone saying, I want to buy your solution, whether it's services or products or whatever. And, and then you come up with a break process and path to go, go down the right, uh, the fastest path. Yeah. Right. And so, so I'm oh, sorry. No, to answer Khan's question is, do you go to an attorney? Typically, you don't go to an attorney for that, right? So you, you do need to, however, uh, research how the process works for that agency, or you go to an expert that actually helps you um, with that process. And uh, uh, But it's typically not an attorney, although attorneys will have some knowledge on that, of course. And then there's lots of attorneys around town these days that do proposals on top of the law. <laughs> so... That dumbfounds me, but anyway, that's a topic for another day, and I believe that's in July. So, uh, but, but Jennifer, if you could advance like the rest of the bullets here, I, I think um, this kind of will give um, our listeners a little bit more insight on some of the um, the, the steps and, and complexity of uh, you know of what we're trying to discuss here, and, and some of the things here. Um, are, are really, if you look at this, um, and I find this very uh, interesting, is that uh, small businesses and, and, and some, some, you know, uh, BD salespeople in general are, they're so wrapped around talking about themselves, right? It just really kind of grates me when you want to understand more about like the solution or, you know, their capabilities. Um, and they talk about, you know, their socioeconomic class and, you know, like I'm an 8A hub zone. I'm like, that's great. But where are your skill sets, right? Like, where have you worked before? What is, what kind of solution, you know, um, are, are you proposing? Are you developing, um, you know, tailoring these different conversations and these different, I guess you say elevator pitches or, you know, um, and capability statements is really kind of like, really the, the crux of where I think a lot of, it separates the people who are very effective and those who are really not. And so, um, you know, something as simple as like active listening, um, like th these are like some of the soft skills and some of the other things that, you know, I can't wait for Stephen to talk about is that like, I really listen to what people have to say and then I will tailor my conversations and my questions. And half the times when I'm speaking with someone, I'm asking them more questions than I'm actually like trying to, you know, explain or describe what it is that I know. And so, um, you know, I find that when you're in front of a customer or when you're speaking to, you know, like your government customer, um, is that we don't really listen. A lot of salespeople don't like to listen because I think they're so trained to pitching, right? You know, I think some of the best people who pitch are people who like are actively listening to the customer and are, are focused around a solution. Um, and you can you can tell whether or not someone is technically, you know, um, capable and whether or not they have the technical like expertise and the past performances, um, probably in the first five minutes of discussing what do you know about this customer? What do you know about this program? What do you know about this methodology or, you know, or this system? Um, that will speak volumes. And, and I think the government, you know, like the government, if you don't give the government credit enough, they really do know how to like sort out, you know, those who know and those who are just faking it until they can make it. Yeah. And um, just let's just kind of go quickly through what those bullets are, right? So positioning is a trusted advisor to the government customer. Again, you know, you're not doing really sales, you're there to support help and aid in the mission of the government agency. And when you completely reframe your thinking uh, from that perspective, uh, then it's, it's a very different outlook, right? So a trusted advisor can tell the government, I am not the best company to do this for you, that one will, right? And you can actually point at your arch nemesis and competitor to say, hey, you know, for this particular task, we're not the one, right? Because I'm thinking about you first us second right you're kind of playing a long game in that case right so you're there to answer their questions to help them with the things you know to help them you know be be the be the shoulder that they you know cry on and uh be somebody they vent to uh but uh essentially developing that relationship takes takes a while but it's totally worth it 
Um, so another one is CFR and FAR rules regarding interfacing with the government, right? So like you need, that's, that's some of the basics, right? So like you don't, uh, if you want to have lunch now that we can, right? So, or at least the vaccinated people can, uh, go with, uh, go out and have the uh, lunch or with the government, you let them suggest the place and you Dutch treat with the government and you are not trying to take them to some steakhouse where, you know, they, they'll feel like, hey, you know, why did you drag me to this place and I don't have to pay my portion of the bill? You know, there's all kinds of rules, right? So gifts and things like that. Uh, building and maintaining customer relationships, that's a skill, right? So some of us are good at it. Some of us are not so good at it. Some of us are good at maintaining a rapport, but we are terrible with follow-up, right? Why? Because we're not wired that way. You know who is a genius at networking and follow-up? Jennifer. She's like one of the best networkers in DC area, if not the best, right? So she, that's her gift, right? But not everybody is that way. I understand it's a skill and it's also a gift. Uh, building and maintaining uh, customer relationships is also really, you know, like you have to actually know how to do people, so to speak. There's some people people and there's project people and there's a whole spectrum and you need to understand, be very clear with yourself where you fit. Uh, active listening, uh, Tan already covered, right? So you have to listen deeply and not be on transmit only for mouths, no ears. Um, so um, white paper, point paper, and key study preparation. You have to understand what these are for and uh, uh, how to use them. I, we actually did, uh, I actually did a webinar for Jennifer a while ago on that. So um, you can probably search uh, for that. Um, capability statement ta tailoring, again, Tom has uh, covered that. It has to be tailored to this customer. One sheet of paper that you smack in front of us <laughs> put in front of every customer and saying hey you know here you go here's who we are as it's very impersonal um, solution development that is where you prepare ahead of time so when you go to the client you're not there going like hi i would like to tell you about ourselves no you're talking about what they're doing their projects and how you're going to help them because you have done your research and you brainstormed so you're not showing up basically doing just sort of this blind marketing because that's bad marketing, right? So Steven's going to talk about good marketing, right? And good marketing is very tailored to your audience and it actually targets a very specific audience. And then a statement of work development is what you can really help the government, not just statement of work, but the whole RFP. You can really help the government make their procurement better. And when you write the rules, guess what? It's a lot easier to win the game. So I think that that really segues nicely into like our next slide. Um, and we've been, I know, you know, this is the great part about this panel is that we've worked in so many different sectors and we've worked across so many different functional areas that it was really difficult to come up with, you know, individual questions that didn't kind of bleed into each other. Or, you know, it's like, so now we're down like this rabbit hole and we just kept going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Um, and, and so, you know, like, I think this next slide um, kind of tees it up really nicely is, you know, um, and it's kind of a common theme and a thread that we've been trying to pull throughout the entire, you know, um, panel discussion, and, and Stephen's going to put that nice bow on it for us here, um, it, is that, you know, it, it is all about, like, customer and, like, how well do you know the customer and how, you know, like, how much of your homework have you done? Um, and also being able to speak, you know, um, with the customer in a way that they're going to, you know, understand um, and that you're going to be able to kind of understand them. So, you know, it, it ties into the whole, you know, homework discussion um, is that, you know, always kind of be prepared um, for who you're speaking to. And not only that, but, you know, like prepare for the event. Right. So it's like a lot of times um, and I think the procurement conference is coming up here in a couple of weeks. It's virtual, unfortunately. But at the annual procurement conference, you know, that's always been a nice conference to go to. It's like every government buyer was going to be there. Right. You're always going to be able to, you know, um, you know, uh, interface and network organically with a customer. You know, we can't do it again this year. Um, but it is one of those things where, you know, like practice, practice, practice. And a lot of times speaking to the customer is, is very difficult. Um, you know, I know that, you know, some of the business owners that I work with, they are very technical. Um, they started their business because they had a service or they had a product or they had a skill set that they felt was marketable and they want to sell directly to the government. And so they can speak at a technical level, but now they can't speak 
government ease, like, you know, like the government language or like use the terms that the government is familiar with. And so I think that, you know, like this slide, and I think Jennifer, you want to go to the next slide, it, it kind of like piggybacks really nicely together is that because of some of that language barrier, um, there is, you know, there is some, you know, barriers to entry and um, that you have to kind of learn a different language. So Mark mentioned before about, you know, like all the acronyms. I have to stop myself sometimes when I speak and, and, and some independence on like, you know, what circle I'm speaking in and different things like that. Like I will spell out almost as if I was writing a proposal, like, like I'm writing a verb, I'm verbally dictating a proposal right now, right? Define the acronym at the first use. And so, you know, it's like I will define everything and I'll, I'll make sure that we're all on the same page because, um, you know, language on the FedCiv side is going to be very different than the DOD language and is very different than on the IC side too. So understanding also like your business sectors that you're marketing to and the, you know, and the services that you're selling to is that, while the government buys, let's just use something easy, like administrative services, right? Like from professional services, all federal sectors buy that. FedCiv, DOD, Intel, right? But they define that and they also speak about those types of services in very different ways. And so, you know, I think like the biggest barrier is the fact that a lot of owners and a lot of companies don't do their homework, they don't get smart enough, and then they don't sound, um, and they're not coming across very well when they're we're speaking to that. And then, then there's also like the knowledge, you know, um, the knowledge gap too, right? Understanding the, the BD sales, you know, cycle, um, on the GovCon side, uh, public sector side, is very different than on the commercial side. So, you know, it's like, you know, what are some of the, you know, challenges that that you see, Mark, with, with your clients when you speak to them, you know, like, because um, it is kind of one of those, you know, I, I feel like I'm always level setting expectations. I'm a little bit of a downer sometimes. I, I like burst their balloons, you know, they think that they're going to get into like the government market and make millions and billions of dollars because that's the only thing that you see in the newspaper. But at the same time, it takes a lot of work. Yeah, you know, it really does. And I've got some funny stories about the language barrier, um, which we, like I said, we, we take for granted. But I mean, we've been doing this, speaking this language for a long time. I had a client of mine who was in a big high level meeting with DOD executives. And he was a US citizen, but he'd come from New Zealand, he was born and raised in New Zealand. So he had a language barrier to begin with, just with, a, with accents and then the idioms that they have. And a general actually stopped him. He kept asking every other sentence, what does that mean? Asking the general to translate what he was saying. The general said, stop now, don't say another word. And Mark will translate when you get out of there. And I'm like trying to kick the guy under the table, he's too far away. Anyway, uh, so, so the language barrier is a big thing. The expectation barrier is, is another big thing because while we can get deals done pretty quickly, it's never fast enough, right? And, and, and they don't quite understand if we take you in to meet with a CIO of an agency, which is a very high level position. You know, I mean, in terms of money spent, the government CIOs have way more power than, than, than almost all commercial CIOs. And they think, well, we met with the CIO, so the order's coming next week. You know, there's a whole process thing that they don't quite understand. And and and, and it really is, it's, I, I said it before, it's this access. You have to meet with these people, and, and the decision makers, or, or you won't get anywhere. It's, you, you know, they've got to be there. You got to meet with them, you know, whether virtually or in person, but there's got to be that, that, that ability to get in front of them, which is kind of the inner circle thing. I hate to say it, but it really is, you know, they're working with people they know what, know, and have known for years. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the many, many, many years I've been doing this and my team as well, we have a very senior staff. We have uh, we have great relationships with the government. We can get in there and discuss these mm -hmm. and they'll be telling us what they're looking for as well for that trusted advisor perspective. So there's really a lot of challenges. And but it is it is that 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 other, when you mentioned it, and I kind of forgot about that. But it is a constant with us. It's that expectation setting. And uh, and of course, you always they all want to come in and close the deal for us. Well, let me come in and close the deal. for you. And there's that isn't how it works here. <laughs> right. That way, but yeah. Anyway, it's 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 but the language is a challenge, and getting in front of these people biggest challenges. So I love I, I love the question about you know is there an inner circle because um, you know 
there are some there are some owners who just grind it every day. They are the hardest charging people. They are everywhere. They are active on LinkedIn. They are active in associations and organizations. Um, they really make an effort to like understand the customer and get in front of the customer. And um, and they're 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 miraculous about it. But then there are some other you know CEOs or VD executives who like to hide behind their computer and hide behind emails. And unfortunately, just like on the commercial side, the public sector is still very people oriented. It's very relationship based. It's not saying that you can't, you know, like break into it, that it's like this, you know, club that you have a secret handshake, you know, it's like, I'm a sorority girl, right? We've got the secret handshake, but you know, like we have, you know, we have a whole process of, you know, bringing in initiatives and stuff like that. And the government's the same way. and. You know, I, I think what I really appreciate on the on the government side, and especially during uh, the pandemic, is that the government has been incredibly um, transparent. Um, they've been super available. Um, I would have to say, you know, I, I did a presentation for PTAC, and we talked about how do you how do you market and sell to the government during COVID, right? Because you can't walk the halls now, right? That whole term, like walk in the halls and, you know, like really kind of being where the government customer is, is that, you know, you kind of have to do things in a little creative way, but because of the pandemic, um, the different, you know, small business liaisons and the Ozdebu offices um, and, and even program people within the different agencies, they are so much more available now. They will take calls more now. They will respond to emails more now. Yeah, I mean, um, I, think, I think there's a psychological factor to it, right? So people have been just more isolated, so they're more willing to talk to strangers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and 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 they're and they're are they're appearing at you know like different events, and and I you know like one of the um, you know Hondo Gertz on LinkedIn is one of my favorite people, you know, with the Office of the Navy. Um, he has been great during the pandemic with, you know, staying in touch with industry and stuff like that. And so um, government has really made a huge effort to do that. And I think we as industry need to do the same and extend the same, you know, like courtesy and, and expectation of ourselves um, and, and, and to like kind of put ourselves out there and, and be very active about it. Um, but, you know, there are ways to doing it. There's, there's no magic sauce behind that. And, and unfortunately I get asked a lot, like, well, can't you just introduce me to so-and-so? I was yeah. like, well, yes, I can, but will I? No. Uh, you yeah. know, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm not here to sell my Rolodex, but I will give you, you know, like every opportunity to make sure that you can get in front of that person. And then you sell it, right? You make your pitch, you develop that relationship. I can't develop that relationship for you. Yep. Do we have to move along to get, make sure we get Steve yep. in here? Yeah. Yep. Oh, here we go. Given how much I've contributed to the previous conversations, you can tell that my part is a little different, but very <laughs> supportive of their part. And uh, before we get into the importance of strategic communications and branding and all of that, let's just talk about communications. Communications is vital in your personal life, in your professional life, communicating to all the various people in your life, whether it's people at home, whether it's co-workers, whether it's customers, prospects, teaming partners. And yet, despite it being so important, so many companies just don't do it. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So this is a graphic, this is an ad that McGraw-Hill Publishing Company, where I, I worked for many years ago, they came out with this ad, oh, I don't even know, far before, before my time. And it's this grumpy looking fellow and he's sitting there and you're supposed to be a salesperson. And he says, I don't know who you are. I don't know your company. I don't know your company's product. I don't know what your company stands for. I don't know your company's customers. I don't know your company's record. I don't know your company's reputation. Now, what was it you wanted to sell me? This is so true. It happens in government. And if you uh, are of the mindset that marketing or strategic marketing, strategic communications is a waste of money, uh, I would say go work in a government agency. I did, I worked in an IT department, and I can tell you they're normal, they're humans, and they are susceptible to the same level of communications everybody is. They read the newspapers, they read emails, they listen to 
whatever, uh, podcasts, and strategic communications has an enormous impact. I'm going to shift to the right part of this slide and say brand or be branded. I contend that it's your obligation in your company to try your best to brand your company. You will never own 100% of your brand because there are too many other parts of the equation out there. Your employees are out there. They're part of your brand. Uh, your delivery, every single, every single interaction you have with the customer is part of your brand. Sometimes things may not go your right way. So, but, but it's your obligation to try the best you can to own your brand and to own your communications. That's also very hard. There are too many elements involved communicating about you. You have yourself or your marketing department, but you also have your customers communicating about you. You have your prospects communicating about you. You have your teaming. You have your employees. You have your disgruntled employees communicating about you. So there's a lot of elements on there that are going out, talking about your company, talking about your brand. I strongly urge you to try your best to own your communications and to own your brand. Okay, next slide, please. We could spend, oh my gosh, we could spend a series of these webinars just talking about strategic communications, how to do it. Um, and, and I thought it would be good just to, just to articulate what I think are the more obvious uh, missteps I think companies make. And, the, you know, maybe your company does some of these, and if so, I'm sorry. Uh, but each of these seven are easily, easily rectified. And I encourage you to, to think it through. Some companies, number one, don't do any marketing communications at all. What is up with that? It's not expensive. What is up with that? I, I had lunch uh, yesterday with a friend of mine. She works for a small uh, integrator. They don't do any marketing communications. They don't even have a newsletter. Why? I suspect the reason is the senior management, in this case it was true, don't understand it. They think it's a waste of money, don't know how to measure it. But it is vital. All right, public sector communications is handled out of headquarters. This is per primarily pertinent to OEMs. Uh, you know, sometimes these big companies, there are people out of headquarters, oh, I can handle it, like I'll handle all the other verticals. Mm, no, no, this market truly is different. It has a different language. It has a different tempo. It has a different process on how they buy, as you've heard already. Now, now that is a huge mistake, and I'm gonna give you a little uh, example of that. I was on a call with one of my clients, big publicly traded company, and it was uh, the, Marketing for the public sector was handled out of headquarters. I was on a call and their head of marketing was so proud of the plan he put together on how they're going to communicate to primaries. And I said, prime to myself, primaries. Hmm, that's a new one on me. I maybe I should call Mark Hogan and find out who the, <laughs> what are primaries. They were. <laughs> so then it dawned on me what he meant was primes. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, this This poor chap is going to probably end up spending a million dollars and it's going to be wasted. Um, I really strongly urge if marketing is, is going to be done in your company, have it done by somebody that understands public sector. Here's a very tangible mistake I see even big companies do. They have no database or a poorly comprised database. Databases have two, I think, two hurdles. One is to develop them, and it should include clients and prospects and partners and media and investors. You got to really think very broadly on who your stakeholders are. Um, that's one problem, is just getting that. The second problem with databases is maintaining them. You should expect the database to turn over about 30% a year. So if you have a database, let's say, of 5,000 people on a database, which is a good size, uh, expect that in order to maintain that number, you're going to have to re replenish 30% of it. So building a database is tough. Keeping it is tough, but it's so important. There's another strategy that I, I see people not do is no social media. Uh, again, it's not hard. 
Um, it takes time, there's no question. Like so many other things in strategic communications, it's easy to do, it's hard to do well, but it's very much worth it. And it's easily measured. Um, talk about measurement, that's number five. Some people don't know how to measure. And the one that really kills me is when, especially senior managers and like um, CEOs, I've had this discussion, is they'll measure it against revenue. In this market, you cannot measure a marketing strategic activity against revenue. You're asking for just erroneous results. There are measurements. If, if one of the objectives is to grow a database, if one of the objectives is to grow your following, measure it against that. But don't measure it against revenue because in this market, revenue could lapse. Uh, you could be going after a big program that's in some things maybe beyond your control. Maybe it's uh, the prime, the primary <laughs> is, is dictating things. Here's another one, easily solved, but I see it all the time, poor communications between sales and marketing. Salespeople are out in the market saying one thing. Marketing people are putting out their material saying something else. The easiest way, and I've found the easiest way to solve this, is the marketing department once a quarter, once every six months, host a luncheon. For the cost of buying the sales team a sandwich, you could do a focus group and truly understand how they're communicating to their customers. And one of the questions, I've led many of these discussions, one of the questions I always love asking is I ask everybody to take out a piece of paper and just jot down in one sentence how you describe your company and just keep it there. And then after everyone's done, I ask them to turn it over and to talk about what, what how they describe their company. It's remarkable, the, the divergent ways people describe a company or a product. So I really think sales and marketing have to be in sync. Number seven, um, a lot of companies feel that they are the only ones who are communicating about their brand. And that is erroneous. As I said earlier, there are so many people communicating. The best you can do, the best you can do is try to own as much of it as possible. You'll never own 100% of the communications effort on your company. Lastly, uh, next slide, please, Jennifer. Um, again, we could do a whole webinar on how to develop a marketing, strategic marketing uh, program. I would point everybody, uh, though, that if you're serious about it, it's a pretty simple process. I would encourage you to look up Simon Sinek on YouTube. He has some phenomenal uh, videos on this. And I'll just do it in a nutshell. Basically, and I'm gonna read from bottom up. The first is you want to describe what your product is. That's important, obviously, or what your service is or what you're about. Second thing that's important is how you do it, the process. It could be you're more efficient, it could be better pricing, but the most important thing, and sometimes, and oftentimes actually, it's overlooked, is why. What's the motivation? So people want to know about what you do, what you sell. They want to know how you, you sell it or how you are more uh, efficient or better than the next person. But what they really want to know is why. And that's not an easy thing to determine, but I certainly encourage you to do it. And, and look up Simon Sinek on YouTube and you'll see a, just a, a wealth of terrific YouTube uh, videos on that topic. Okay, that's it for me. I'm out of breath, boy. I've been doing all the talking. I've been hogging everything today. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, love what you said there, Stephen. Uh, some very valid points about marketing and sales being on the same page. And um, we'll move over to some uh, additional questions. And everyone that's on the line today, again, thank you for joining us. Please feel free to type in any questions that you have re related to sales, business development, capture, marketing, uh, specific to your company or general. There's a chat button on the right-hand side towards the bottom uh, on your control panel. Uh, so over to Alessia, Mark, and Tan. What is a fully functional sales team? Well, let me let me let me um, pick, you know start this discussion. Right. So um, in for, in the world of uh, BD capture and proposals, where I operate normally. So. Uh, 
a fully functional sales team, right? Is that the front end? And uh, you have um, a team that basically has someone who is always looking for opportunities to add to the pipeline, right? So, and they are looking at expiring opportunities. They are looking, you know, expiring contracts that become an opportunity. They're looking for new opportunities uh, that are being publicized by the government. And they are creating opportunities as well. Uh, in some cases, that is somebody who is, uh, you know, talking to the customer and kind of seeding the need for something, right? So that's usually two years in advance. So the government can get the money, but sometimes they can get the money because they just have something left over, right? So then you have the person who is uh, going to be qualifying the opportunities. And that's doing kind of the top down capture. They're actually going to be doing a lot of your research initially. They're going to be identifying who the customer is. They're going to be verifying this opportunity with the customer, talking to the customer, making sure it's not a pipe dream. Like just recently, we had uh, a client who had an opportunity in their pipeline. They were really serious about chasing. It was one of their priorities. And after calling the government, we found out that that opportunity is basically been awarded two months ago. The government just forgot to post the information about it and they were still chasing them. So it happens, it happens all the time. So you have to have people verify the opportunities during the qualification. You have to look at that opportunity very closely to see if it's winnable, what is its win probability, what, what is it, its probability of go, like how likely is it going to be actually issued, is it funded? You know, what is the acquisition strategy? All kinds of things that you need to figure out and all the background, right? So like, could you do it through teaming? Could you do it with the competition, given the competition, right? So um, what would be the solution possibly, right? So you're looking at it from a top-down capture perspective. Somebody needs to be doing that on a constant basis. And then there are capture managers who are essentially uh, chasing each individual opportunity uh, in a detailed way, positioning well ahead of the before the RFP, well ahead of the RFP, so that the winning is is a slam dunk. Now, when you're really small, it's one person wearing all the hats. You still have to do all of this, or you outsource that. So, if I could just Martin. add quick structure, yeah. So I I've been fortunate. I started and, and have run some of the largest uh, government sales organizations. I was one of the founders of Oracle Federal back a long time ago, and, and like I said, BEA before I came here. And, and my structures were pretty simple. Uh, I And it doesn't necessarily answer the functional because you hope that you hire the right people, which is what makes it functional. But but I broke it down into civilian Department of Defense and Intelligence agencies. Each one of those had sales, BD as separate people across the board there. Um, I generally would share marketing between the intelligence and the DOD just to save a headcount. And the partner managers, I would I would share there as well. And then I think one of the overlooked things is having a strong research group to help you wade through the mass of information, find out things like competitive information. Um, you know, at BEA, my researchers would find out who the good salespeople were at IBM, who was our competitor, and then give their names to headhunters to get them out of there. Um, so having that strong support, um, we called it marketing. It was really more lead gen as well, but uh, uh, we had communications people uh, the, that I should have hired Steve for, frankly, <laughs> back then. <laughs> and that's, that's what, that was the structure, if you would. So, and each one had their own role and each one rolled up, uh, you know, with quotas and and, uh, and overlay quotas and things like that. And that's how we managed it. It was really very binary by the numbers. And and I, I tried a couple of things in my career, trying to make it different, maybe a different structure. Uh, but I've discovered, what I discovered for me you know, personally that, that, that that structure works the best for me. Um, I also guest lecture at business schools on selling to the government, and that's that's what I teach in my classes is that same structure. So I came up through small businesses um, where I had to be the person who, you know, was the sales, the ops, the timesheets, the laptops, the, you know, HR. Um, and, and so I, I see um, the sales team being uh, very interconnected and almost kind of like in a matrix type of environment um, where, you know, if, if we have you know, participants who are on the call here who are coming from the, um, you know, the, the uh, commercial sector, it, it's kind of like, you know, organizing your company in terms of like outside sales, inside sales, and then you've got your operations, right? Um, and so for, you know, for like your, your sales team to be, uh, you know, uh, really effective, uh, they, 
we need to think less in a very stovepipe kind of way. Um, and, and I think that's really hard for, for people um, just because they, you know, uh, you know, small businesses, you know, in particular, um, different functional groups can be very territorial. You know, it's like, this is my domain. This is what makes me unique. This is what I can control. And, um, you know, when you approach, you know, government sales and government contracting in, in, in that manner, um, you become less effective um, to the point where you are um, probably going to cost the company, uh, you know, money and rework, um, possibly miss opportunities. Um, it develops like, you know, really um, bad organizational, you know, your, your organization is less cohesive um, in, in that regards. And so um, I, whenever I go into an organization, I, I, I try to kind of break down some of the stovepipes and, and, and speak to people, in, you know, in a less, you know, like um, less stovepipe kind of way. But then at the same time, uh, you know, time, you know, I want to bring Steve into this conversation too. Is that communications is kind of key, not only within the organization, but like with with the customer then too. Like, what are we trying to communicate, um, you know, like out there? Um, and and when we don't bring everybody to the table, um, I find a lot of times when they have sales and BD meeting there are certain players that are not at the table. And I think that's wrong because, you know, you need your program people to provide inputs. And so I know this conversation is not about, you know, the, the, the BD or capture life cycle about different, you know, color team reviews and milestone reviews and your different gate reviews um, in the bid no bid process. But it kind of goes to the fact that we're, you know, you need to have the right sales and BD and capture and proposal and organizational people at the table at that one time. And so your sales team in general is not only just your, your you know, your active sales BD people, but it needs to be the, you know, your directors or your people who are, you know, overseeing the different, you know, um, business lines, your line managers need to be part of that conversation. And so that you can have a very, you know, um, cohesive type of communications approach, communication strategy, um, and so that you're putting the same, you know, same message out there all the time. I, I just want to add one thing. Uh, uh, one of the other errors, I didn't have it in my uh, slide, but is the lack of strategy. And in the <clears throat> strategy, if you just go through the who, what, when, where, how, who is it we need to talk to, communicate to, and that's usually a lot of different people but it's often not considered. The second is, all right, what is the general message we want to communicate? How we, what is the budget that we have? How are we going to communicate it? By what means? Uh, is it going to be a blog? Is it going to be a podcast? Is it just going to be public relations? Just what are the means? How are we going to measure it against whatever the objectives we establish in the strategy? How are we going to uh, measure and revise? Because you never get it right 100%. It's still, even though it's gotten very scientific communications, it's still an art and uh, you've got to continually revise. So I, I would say that a thing that's often missing is that strategic analysis that's that's needed. I think strategy is missing across the board on a lot of different fronts, right? Yeah. You know, so um, I, I, I just wrote down a couple of things that you were saying um, is that I, I, I think a lot of times uh, small businesses, um, more so than probably the large businesses, are in a very reactive kind of mode. Mm -hmm. They're reacting to something. They're reacting to a SAMS or formerly FBO, for those of us who are old. Um, you know, like when SAMS used to provide you notifications of new opportunities, but they're responding um, and reacting to something instead of being very proactive about you know, a longer lead gen time, a longer capture cycle, you know, a, a longer sourcing, you know, um, type of timeline um, is that you're more effective if you, you know, use that type of strategy, but like there's there's missing strategies across the board and, and that it goes to the crux of whether or not an organization, you know, like is, is effective. Uh, but, you know, Steve, with that regard then is that, you know, when you're communicating and you're implementing all of these social strategies and these social media, you know, strategies and, you know, um, these activities, um, I find sometimes companies str struggle with 
how much is too much, right? Like how much is too much sharing? Because for someone like myself, who I, I would consider myself more of a true capture person, I love digging intel. I love digging dirt on a company. I love, you know, finding out who the incumbents are. Why are they there? Are they loved? You know, like all that detail. And sometimes it's as easy as going to someone's LinkedIn page or their Twitter feed or their website, and they will spill the beans on everything. And so like, where is that fine balance between, you know, providing too much intel out there for, you know, for, for people who like to dig up information like self or, you know, just enough that that shows that you've got this credibility. I tell you that is a great question, and my response is experience will tell you how much is too much or how much you know. You want to put enough out there to achieve whatever objective is. Maybe your objective is to have them download a white paper or whatever. Um, so is, there's a fine line, and experience tells you where that line is. At some point, somebody's going to say, you know, we've been putting out too much content because Tan's going out there and taking it all. So, yeah. and I'm using it against you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we have clients. We have clients who actually have uh, come here to the office to to a meeting, and and they'll come and bring in a full binder of all of our newsletters and the content that we put out. And they will be like, "Yeah, we're following you to a T." <laughs> so the whole methodology is published out there. There have been many times, actually. That's interesting. Okay. Ready for the next slide? And then we can, we've got a couple of audience questions that have come in that we can get to as well. I think that was the last one. Yeah, it looks like it was. Okay. Uh, so the first question reads, and again, please feel free to type in your questions. We're not going to read off your name. So uh, let me read the first one. When and in what ways does it make sense for a very small or emerging business to engage experts to assist with business development or sales? Well, well um, my answer is as soon as possible. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. You said as soon as yeah, possible. I mean, if you, yeah, that's if, if, you, if you're going after the biggest market in the world um, and, and you think you can make an impact in there with your solution, then then yeah, as soon as possible. It's, it's uh, you know, generally outsourced capture outsource sales like this is far more cost effective than hiring people um, and it's 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 a it's a sound strategy to go forward yeah the, you know I'll, I'll add to that it's very very hard to find a competent uh, business developer uh, for a reasonable price a small business can't afford and even the ones you yeah. can't afford and you stretch and you throw all your money into you're probably going to fire within the next half a year to a year to a year and a and half you know, because yeah and you know why you know why people fire their BD salespeople like more often than not is that what I'm finding is that um, business owners don't quite know what to ask and what to expect. Um, and so it's that level setting of the expectations, right? You know, like um, I find sometimes people will throw around certain terms or certain titles and like they expect, you know, it's kind of like in proposals, right? I could say, we're gonna do a red team. My idea of a red team is gonna maybe be a little different than your idea of a red team. But so I, I don't like to talk about, you know, like titles like that, but it's like, okay, if you want a BD person, what are the activities, what are the qualities and what are the like outcomes that you're expecting? Um, and, and like being very clear in the expectations is that, you know, like a lot of times business owners don't get what they need or don't, don't get what they quote unquote expect or feel like they're entitled to. Um, but, you know, maybe it's because the sales cycle is off. Maybe it was because they're selling potentially to the wrong customer. Um, there's so many reasons why BD salespeople are not effective. Um, and it's not always necessarily because they're a bad person at it. It's just they either weren't qualified or didn't meet the level of expectation that that business owner imposed on them. I'll speak to that. This is this is one of my soapboxes. Um, so I find that even working with consultants, uh, their knowledge base is Swiss cheese. Really, they know a lot about this, and they know absolutely nothing about that. And that's why we, you know, after a while, actually founded our Bid Proposal Academy, and now we have the apprenticeships for government business developers because people literally need a systematic approach 
on you know from a to z on how to do things and there's so few people out there that's literally like just little uh torches of competence <laughs> that are out there i mean they exist right but a lot of the industry is swiss cheese of i know a lot about this and i sound really competent and i know absolutely nothing and i'm totally novice in doing certain things like you know i, I you know, we get people in our classes all the time and they've been in capture for 10 years and they don't know how to search on USA spending that though. Right. And so like this is this is what I'm talking about. It's just like on how to connect the dots where it comes to data. So we, we teach that in our classes. Now to tackle your question, and I mean I'll I'll give Mark a chance to answer too, but my kind of view on it is if you're a small business owner, you have to look at your budget, right? So how much money do you have? Do you have money to really become the business developer, which I always advise 100% anyways, because you're in a business of business development if you own a government contracting business. So that's number one, get trained. Actually get educated. And the number two answer is yes, as soon as possible, agree with Mark, um, get somebody competent to help you because there's only so many hours in a day and there's one thing you cannot stretch is time. Right, and just quickly, just to this has got a sales perspective on it, but I, I've had I, countless conversations with people about, you know, should I hire a person or should I hire you guys? And of course, you know my answer to hire us, but I'm like, what, what, what are you going to ask in an interview? You've never sold to the government yourself personally. What, how can you possibly interview a government salesperson? Because it's totally different, and 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 they could say you you don't know if they know the market, you don't know if they know the people because they could throw any name out. And you won't know the no, answer. It's, it's whoever name drops the most. Exactly. Mark, that's what people yeah. hire. And, and, and you can, anyone can do that, but it doesn't doesn't make a good selection. So and that's who I run away from. So if yeah, you're constantly is. dropping names and tell me that you know someone, it's like, yeah, you know what? They're on my LinkedIn too, and I know them, but you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> and even if you work for the government and you know how to sell, uh, you uh, it does. I mean, you don't know how to sell, right? So like. You, you have to have worked with the government, you understand the rule, you know the people, you have to know how to do BD and sales. Go ahead, Jennifer, sorry. All right, I was gonna say two things. One, I also think sometimes business owners, particularly for federal sales, have unrealistic uh, time expectations. Uh, you know, it's obviously a very long sales cycle. Uh, but second, I wanted to pull Steven and ask, uh, as far as timing, just kind of sticking with the same question, we still have a couple more to get through. Uh, at what point should a company pull in marketing? Should it be in conjunction with sales and BD or before or after, or is there a particular revenue size or number of employees that um, the company should meet before they pull the trigger? Yeah, good question. I would say immediately. And by the way, you know, you, too often you hear, well, uh, we're a small business, so we don't have the advantage of a big business, baloney. Uh, marketing communications will enable any size business to look a lot larger than what, than what they are. Uh, so I always contend that the advantage of that is small businesses. Now, again, I would not necessarily say from a strategic comms perspective, tie it to any particular opportunity. There are things you can do to tie it to an opportunity, but on a strategic level, you should just be thinking continual, consistent, uh, communications. When I say consistent, consistent messaging and consistently out there, however you want to deliver it and measure. Um, there are things you can do tied to specific opportunities, however. And again, we could spend the whole webinar just, just talking about that. Uh, so I think immediately is the answer and be consistent. Great. Okay. Uh, second question is, given Biden's promise uh, an interest to award more small and minority owned businesses. How do you all think uh, small businesses should capitalize on this proposition? Is it expected for him to increase spending on these sorts of businesses by 50% or an additional 100 billion in contracts over five years? Well, I, I mean, the, the fundamentals are the same. I mean, if you're a small business, you know, there's been, depending on the agency, you know, sometimes a 17% set aside for small businesses, sometimes higher depending on the agency. So you have to already be there. It's the same fundamental skills. If, if, if you don't follow what, what all of us have been talking about collectively and delivering your message, you know, uh, identifying the decision makers, having a relationship with them, listening to their needs and all that, then you can't take advantage of the money no matter how much money's there. 
So it's the same kind of thing. It is a great time to be a minority owned business. I mean, let's, let's take advantage of it. Uh, and if you need guidance, you know, certainly this, this, this panel can help you give, guide, give guidance on how to do that. But it's, it, that's a big number and it's, uh, it'll, it'll be interesting. And by the way, very few years over the last 30 years have there been even the 17% minimum. So it'll be hard to make the 50, but it is a great time. And, and I think they will push more contracts that, uh, down to smaller businesses if you're in there and creating demand. Great. And I would also point to the, uh, the looking at the SBA scorecard, uh, which will provide a letter grade for each of the departments on how well or not they did in awarding contracts to small businesses. And then it will give you the breakdown on women-owned, veteran-owned, hub-owned, 8A, and all the rest. Uh, the second half of that report is for how the prime contractors did uh, on awarding uh, the contracts. So uh, you may want to use that as part of your uh, guide or strategy using real live data to fuel where you're going to spend your time and effort. So perhaps picking uh, an agency or department that has the propensity to award contracts to businesses that are like yours. So if you're a small women-owned uh, business and you're in a hub zone, then uh, let's say Department of Commerce did really well with awarding contracts there. Uh, maybe that's one of your targets. Uh, and then maybe you pick an agency that needs to get their grade up and you use that kind of as a, a little bit of a carrot. It shouldn't be what you lead with. It should be leading with your capabilities, but um, right. might be something to keep in mind. Right. Shame wow. the agencies into like using you. Um. <laughs> Right. No, but but the other thing too is that uh, back to like the the agency transparency and you know being very accessible is that many of the agencies I know HUD in particular um, Commerce does this uh, is that they have a lot of um, uh, days that are focused on specific set aside and so there's HUD zone days or you know like HUD will have like a, a woman owned small business day where they will have procurement and contracting professionals and program people kind of talk and brief you on some of the upcoming initiatives, you know, like for that specific agency geared towards that set aside. Great. Okay. And the next question is, what would be your suggestion for a freight forwarder since transportation is something that all agencies need at some point, but contract opportunities are not very frequent to find on SAM.gov? Well, first of all, let's not give Sam any credit. It's one of the worst websites I've ever seen in the world. Very hard to search and all that. Um, zero, zero, zero. Yeah, I, I, I'd almost say this is a good Steve question, right? Because I mean, a lot of it is positioning yourself. It's easy to identify who would be responsible for freight forwarding. I mean, the good news about the, the government is they publish you know, most of their positions and people in the positions. Is how do you how do you efficiently get the message out there that you're a candidate for that and then talk to them? What's going to get together and, and create demand? But you know, that's probably a great, you know, you know Steve. You know, what, what, and I've, uh, to be honest with you, I've never uh, dealt with a freight forwarding company. However, one thing I've been really stressing with clients is to really position yourself on a strategic level as a thought leader. And when I say that is maybe they want to pursue some sort of a blog where they can develop a database of names of people who are involved in freight forwarding. And, and, not just talk about the specifics of freight forwarding, but talking about maybe transportation, maybe talking about clean energy as it pertains to freight forwarding, talk about different ancillary products or ancillary issues that pertain to the general business that they're in. Um, so again, I've, I've never dealt with a company like that, but um, I'm, I'm sure having been in government, there's a lot of money chasing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, not familiar too with it is it just like a, a supply chain forwarding um you know type of industry um I, I would say you go to like your logistic agencies right so um mm -hmm. dla is is the primary one uh, defense logistics agency um they're very um you know they're very small business friendly if you are set aside um you know there are several vehicles um uh, that they do contract off of um, I know that I, I worked on an opportunity uh, and they work both CONUS and OCONUS. So for those who aren't familiar um, within the United States and outside the continental United States too. Um, and a lot of the OCONUS works has to do with subsistence work. Um, and so they will um, tra transport everything from fuel, trucks, parts, to uh, water, soda, food, um, anything that is going to be supporting the warfighter. 
um, and specifically towards like different um, um, modes of transportation too. So it's 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 both um, freight, um, trucks over land, um, and and uh, bar uh, barges over you know across the ocean too. Great, and uh, we've got about uh, five or six minutes left. I just want to uh, put everybody's con our speakers' contact information here in case you want to contact them for about their services or working with them. Um, I believe everybody does work with small as well as large businesses. Uh, and then our next question is, other than actually bidding on specific projects, what are the opportunities that business owners can pitch or, uh, or do sales to government agencies? I guess what are the sales activities that they should be uh, engaged in? Yeah, I, if, I, if I understand the correct the, the question correctly, I, I think that's coming back to the, the the sole sourcing that I was talking about. You know, you've got to identify the opportunity, the agency, identify the decision makers, and then go in and 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 make sure you understand it, pitch to the decision makers, and when the heads nod yes, then propose a sole source or something other than an RFP. If I understand that cr question correctly, it's kind of what we covered. And, and the other way, and it, it's, it's I will say Sam's a little bit better about this, is they do have these o, uh, OTAs that are being published out there. And, and they're, they're sometimes hard to find, but that's where you submit, you know, a few page white paper and some slides and can, uh, it's, it's, it's not as directed. It's, it, it doesn't have the demand creation behind it. So the success rate is going to be fairly small. But, you know, this is, I, I tell people, sales 101, you got to identify, qualify, uh, understand the, the the process and understand the the procurement path. So I kind of see that question more along the lines of um, with Steve, like it, it like sales is also you know like getting your name out there, you know like establishing that presence, like who who are you, um, establishing that that media presence. You know, it's like I, I've worked with some small businesses that have been very successful and. Um, when you go and try to find anything about them, like, you know, like the customers don't recognize them, right? Like you have to be more known in the industry. I mean, you have to know where the government buyers and the, and the government, you know, decision makers are, are going and getting in front of them, right? So, um, you know, activities in, in associations, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I was just elected to the uh, to the board of directors for FC International, and you know that's that's a great organization for you know for for certain industries to be be a part of, where you're going to be able to get in front of you know like uh, the government, um, sponsoring events, you know like sitting on panels, doing whatever you can do with that in kind type of you know like marketing to kind of get your company out there and establish as an industry leader. So you know, Steve, that. The only thing I would also say, I really, I just, I think you're right on, Ton. But the only thing I would also say is think consistency. So if you're going to, let's say, sponsor a panel, try to do something ahead of that panel, do the panel, and try to do something counter uh, after the panel um, that just, you know, just has a consistency in terms of what your your name is and what you stand for. Great. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the, the question about when to pull the trigger on sales, marketing, and BD. Uh, when we look at making uh, personal decisions on, uh, you know, purchasing a car, a house, it should be a certain percentage of your overall uh, income. I guess throwing this out to you guys, uh, should businesses be spending a certain percentage of their overall revenue on uh, sales or marketing, is there a, a magic number uh, to help companies kind of budget for this and obviously specific to federal contracting? I, I think it, it depends, right? If it's a technology company that's selling a product, it's it's a different ratio than, say, a small 8A that's going to be doing some capture. Um, I, I, I know that one of the qualifying questions I ask when companies come to us about working with them is I'm like, do you have headcount budgeted? And it's it's amazing people say, well, I don't have any headcount budgeted to get in the government space. You, you have to look at it seriously and, and have, uh, you know, something set aside. And I don't think I can tell any CEO what it should be. You know, it depends. Also, the CEO. CEO is an engineer. He's going to have very little set aside. If the CEO is a salesperson, they're going to have a lot more set aside. It's what I've learned. So okay. it's hard to give you an answer on that. But if, if you if you don't have headcount set aside, I, I, the number of people that think that you can get in the government space without any investment, is, uh, is is a pretty staggering yeah. yeah this this is what the i usually tell people is it's a mathematical formula of how much do you really want to win 
right? Yeah. And what it's going to really take. Um, so generally in government contracting, the investment is relatively low. So you're really talking about between three quarters of a percent to 3% uh, of the total value of the opportunity. That is uh, base year plus option years, total contract value. Um, so, and, and that's not counting marketing, by the way. Marketing is going to be on top of that. But uh, when you really say, hey, you know, I've got to win uh, $20 million, I get a book. $20 million uh, by the end of the year, right? So we're not, not going to use when we're going to say, I'm going to have $20 million in bookings uh, before the end of the year. Then uh, what uh, we are uh, really going to have to bid on considering your win rate, let's say that your win rate is 33%, right? So you're going to have to bid on $60 million. And how many proposals is that? And that $60 million, you're going to have to spend uh, between one to uh, three uh, percent of you know the the BNP dollars. Are you going to do that with internal resources? Or are you going to go ahead and outsource that work, right? So you're going to have to invest to make money. You cannot do that for free. Now, in the beginning, when you're really starting out, it may be you and uh, a six pack of beer in a hotel room someplace where you sequester yourself and write those proposals and put them out the door. But you're going to be working half time. The entire time and half time is 12 hours a day seven days a week yep exactly okay great uh well thanks everybody for your participation both the attendees and our great panelists it was wonderful to have you guys participate uh the questions were great uh for all of the registrants we will send you the recording and the powerpoint slides uh again thank you to alessia ton steve and mark uh great to see your faces and hopefully uh, see you guys in person sometime soon uh, join us next month as we cover proposal writing, and uh, that's a wrap. If anybody has anything else to add, uh, speak now. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Take back.